excited about today's uh, conversation. Um, we have Sherry Klein. Uh, Sherry Klein CAS is an Emmy and uh, CAS nominated re-recording mixer for television and film at Smart Post Sound in Burbank, California. Um, she first became aware of audio when studying arranging uh, our, and composition at Berkeley in Boston. Um, her career has led her from musician to live sound to recording engineer and finally to post mixing, where she currently specializes in dialogue and music. Some of her recent credits include Queen of the South, New Amsterdam, The Passage, and Deputy. Sherry, say hello. Hi. Nice to see you all. She's here with her mixing partner, Scott Weber, CAS, um, who have also uh, is uh, Emmy nominated uh, as well, but also is a two-time Emmy award-winning re-recording mixer for his work on Westworld and Lost. Those are pretty cool shows, man. Um, <laughs> he also works for Smart Post, um, uh, Smart Post Sound in Burbank, California with Sherry, and he specializes in sound effects and Foley. Um, he has decades of experience in the industry, and he's going to be really great to have a conversation with today because he has experience in his career coming up as a sound effects and Foley editor himself. So say hello, Scott. Hi, guys. Thanks for uh, all the girls for letting me join in on the party. <laughs> Glad to be here with you. Indeed. Uh, and finally, uh, Marla McGuire, MPSE, who is a supervising sound editor. Um, she's also a fantastic editor. I've had the absolute joy of working with her myself. Um, she has been Emmy and Golden Reel nominated multiple times for her exceptional work. Some of her recent credits include How to Get Away with Murder, Scandal, The Killing, uh, Seven Seconds, and Insecure. I really love Insecure. Um, so <laughs> say hello, Marla. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Um, so before we get started, I actually got a lot of questions that came in about basic workflow that were really centralized about how the dub stage works. So I thought before we got into specific editing questions for the dub stage, if we could just spend two or three minutes talking about um, what a typical dub stage day looks like, um, who gets what edit from who, um, how fixes come in, um, if you guys would like to elaborate on that. Perhaps Sherry, do you want to start? Um, sure. Um, but whatever I'm going to say isn't the gospel because every dub stage works differently. And everything that we're saying here today, you all have to realize, depending on your mixer, your supervisor, the room, the stay, all of it will change. Mm -hmm. It's not the gospel truth. It's, I'm talking about the way that we work, Scott and I. And uh, our supervisor brings in the materials and as well as the music editor, it gets to, um, uh, Scott can get a little bit further into it if he wants to, but the way that we work in a nutshell is we work separately. Um, these days, Scott's been working uh, on pre-dubbing his effects at home. I work in the studio and we send each other files back and forth to refer to. And then he comes in the next day and we work together and put it all together and spend the day refining it. And if we have a three day mix, then the clients come in the third day. If it's a two day mix after lunch the second day, we're playing back for the client. Uh, before that, we still work separately. Even if we were in the same room, Scott would be on headphones. That in itself is our day in a nutshell for day one, two, or day one, two, three, four, however many days that we work. Yeah, I might, I might elaborate uh, for that a little bit. Um, I think it's important at the beginning of a mix um, to um, these days, especially with 5-1 um, mixes and the amount of detail we need to put into the mixes, that we treat our um, TV mixes like mini feature films. So in a way, you really have to have the time to go through all the material. Um, Sherry has to have the time to go through and clean up dialogue and um, match angles and match ADR and all that kind of stuff. And it's very hard to do if all the sound is playing at once in the room. So she needs, um, she needs time in the room by herself to hear that. That's why I adopted a long time ago, if we're in the same room, I just put some headphones on because that allows me to organize my sound effects and get basic balances and that sort of thing. Um, even before COVID started, I started pre-dubbing in a different room and then started working at home because it was easier to have my own space, let Sherry work on her own before we finally came together. And then, you know, it's critical then put everything together to see how it plays and that's how we continue the mix. And, and I would, we both we both spend a lot of time at the beginning of sessions, and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, more after, sort of organizing our food groups. You know, um, it'll come to us a certain way, and then we'll organize it for our minds and the way that we can get to things fast and where we know where everything is. We each do that individually, no matter what the session is, no matter who prepped it, or no matter how many how many people got involved before we got it. 
Right, and I would just say, just nuts and bolts a little bit, that um, when they both sit down to start their mix, they should have the guide tracks, which is usually music effects, dialogue, and ADR, sometimes split out on a separate track, the picture, and all of the AAFs. They used to be called OMFs, but now they're called AAFs. And why I say all on both sides, sometimes people will have like just the things that are labeled dialogue, which is the AAF is what we're getting from the picture department, what the picture editor did that is essentially the Bible because they've all heard it over and over and over again. But it's a good idea to have all of them on both sides because unfortunately you can't always trust the picture department organizationally. And so they might sneak a line of dialogue into an effects AAF, right? And then you don't have access if that, if it's missing or if some, you know, you need to check something, it's, it's not where it should be. So I just, as a supervisor, I just say, listen, let's just have, you know, all the AAFs on both sides. I've definitely might, been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might add something to that. Um, before the mix starts, um, Sherry and I have made a habit of um, being in touch with the picture department and being sure we have a copy of the show before we start mixing. And we spend the time to screen it ahead of time and get familiar with the show. Um, because the intention, what happens in the edit room, follows right through into the dub stage and they expect to hear the same sort of sound design, the same sort of treatment on dialogue, the same levels on music. So I know Sherry even takes notes on all that kind of stuff. So when she gets there, she knows what to expect. And to carry on to that, um, uh, supporting the fact of having the AAF is that um, we need to have those same sound effects and dialogue files available so that if the new sound effects and sound design isn't exactly what it was from the edit room, we have access to those so we can um, use them or refer to them quickly. And who uh, typically sits on the stage with you when you come to, to so it's, is it just you and, and Sherry, Scott, or, or do you have the music editor there for that, the day where you play together from the very top of the day? Uh, is the supervisor there from the very top of the day? Like, what's your pattern? Um, depends on the show. Um, typically, I think at the start of a show, um, we'll have a supervisor with us to make sure that we have all the materials we need and that everything's been delivered properly and that um, if they need to wrangle stuff, they can still do that. Um, I know Sherry likes to have the music editor there from the top because there's a lot of, um, you know, making sure that they have the right stems and all that sort of stuff. So I think to start with, it's, it's typically a supervisor and a music editor. I'd Sherry, say, any, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, if it's the first episode of a new series or a new show that we're working on, yeah, then the music editor will usually come the first day. But once we get rolling, it's been pretty rare to have the music editor unless they really want to be mm -hmm. um, on the dub stage for day one, sometimes even until the afternoon of day two if it's a three-day mix. Otherwise, they'll come right before playback to be there for the client. Most of the time, um, they'll just deliver the music and we'll be I text a lot with my music editors and I'll ask them questions via that since there's no more cue sheets. Mm -hmm. um, it's the easiest way for me because I know they're working is to text them and go, hey, I think there's a problem here or there's something going on here. And unless it's a big deal, they'll just text back what's going on or say, oh yeah, there should be something there or let me and, fix that. And I would just jump in and say that some of these schedules get kind of crazy and we get into short turnarounds. And when that happens, you might not even really have the music on day one. You might have just temp cues to mix against because the composer is still composing. And because of the actor schedule and the turnaround and everything, I might still be shooting ADR on day one of the mix, which means I'm not on the stage. They're doing their thing. I'm shooting ADR. I'm feeding ADR to the stage, which we can talk a little bit about um, later but so you have to just be super flexible and super communicative and that's also why just talking about layout for a second i do what's called my orange group notes where i just like make you know highlight three or four tracks and make it into a group re region color it orange and write notes with like little arrows up and down because if i'm not on the dub stage i want to be able to communicate because not every mixer is going to have time to do the kind of homework that um, Scott and Sherry do as far as listening to the show ahead of time. So they may have never heard or seen the episode. So if I make a note saying listen to Tim, because they also don't have time to sit and go through the whole show and just listen to the guide track. But that's saying, listen, they did something special. Maybe they dropped out all the effects and just left the dialogue. Maybe they dro dropped out all of the dialogue. Or maybe they verbed it out or maybe the music comes up and there's no other sound. So that, so I just leave like little notes so that if I'm not on the dub stage, which a lot of times I'm not, um, they can kind of follow along that way. 
Could you also talk about how you deliver your fixes? Because you're very specific, more so than any supervisor I've ever worked with before, and I love it, and how you organize what you deliver to your mixer to communicate what replaces what. Could you talk about that a little bit, Marla? Thank you. Yeah, I actually, it's something I kind of developed over the years. Um, you know, I have a copy of the dialogue edit, and then, you know, like the first round of fixes would be like, fix A, like fix A1, A2, A3, let's say, in a certain color. Um, so I will grab the dialogue um, that I'm fixing, and if it's an ADR fix, my ADR tends to be very complex because some people, what they do is they shoot all the ADR, and then an ADR editor cuts all the ADR, and they just deliver it to the stage, and the dialogue is put on the X track, which you know, and so some ambient fill is there so that that's going to play with the ADR. Um, but they don't really finesse it. They don't cross between syllables. They don't cross between words. It's just this whole chunk that then Sherry or you have to decide where to do the cross. And I prefer to kind of make all those decisions ahead of time. So I will cut the ADR, cut the dialogue, and I will make a little roadmap. This is what you're talking about. I'll say replace dialogue A, even if it's by replacing it, you're muting it. So I'll mute that track. So all you have to do is grab it and put it on that track and, and, it, and it mutes. You know, I might be mm -hmm. add to dialogue B with a little arrow. And again, these are my little orange notes. Uh, and that might be some extra fill, or I may have had to cut the line that's on dialogue B differently to accommodate mm -hmm. the ADR and where I'm going to cross. So it's just an absolute roadmap. And, and what, we've, what we used to do at Shondaland, because the ADR a lot of times was not shot when we got to the dub stage, is we would put the temp in the, the cut tracks first. And what I mean by that is um, the picture department, like the picture assistant or somebody will just read the line. You know, it's just like bad acting. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you know, they just read the line. Hey, and, stop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and everybody knows that, you know, they can tell that it's the temp and we also color code it as the temp. Mm -hmm. but we leave that in there so that everybody knows what all the pieces are. Because Correct. I'll talk about this later, but a huge issue is missing lines of dialogue or missing words or mm -hmm. adding words, which is really, really can be a huge problem. Um, so if that's already accounted for, and, and not everybody does this. So again, to Sherry's point, everybody does things differently. Um, so now I've got to replace that. So I'll say, you know, replace dialogue E and in parentheses, I'll write mute temp, right? Same thing. Mm -hmm. So you bring up that, copy, paste, it mutes it. So basically... If you follow along in your hymnal, my little notes, and just overlay, replace everything that I've done, it should just play right across. Uh, and then in my session, for those of you who want to be supervisors, um, I won't do that in the tracks because then I don't have any way of remembering or knowing what it was before or where I fixed or what I've done. So I do the thing like I will I'll, I'll mute it and I'll make a little group out of it so it's just like this muted group region and then the fixes are their own separate tracks still at the bottom so at the end of day three let's say I can see in my main you know edit where I've done things and then I'll have a group of like green tracks which is dialogue fix a and then I did another track another fix so that'll be dialogue fix b and there'll be a different color and so you know if you make all the tracks mini or something really really small and you zoom way out mm -hmm. really have a roadmap of everything that you did because I mean, these guys can talk about you and you um you can get yourself way tied up in knots you know what i mean if you don't know what fixes came in and sure yeah. sure <laughs> yeah there's also something that I learned about um, from, well, I mean, I, I knew this, but I really learned to a whole different degree that made me a much better dialogue editor, but also a much uh, better mixer, really, uh, that I learned from you, Marla. And it's these, thing call, these things called magic fills. She keeps, <laughs> a, she keeps a folder of magic fills. Could you talk about your magic fills? <laughs> well, I mean, we all... Yeah, I, I, sure, I, yeah. yeah but, I, I, I never did that before I worked I with her, have, and now I have an arsenal of magic fills. I have 20 little, years of things yeah. <laughs> that I've just grabbed. Squeaks, mm -hmm. even door opens, door breaths, mm -hmm. S's, P's. Anytime mm -hmm. I hear, you know, something that I go, oh, man, that's good. I'm going to grab it. And I have, like, fills from literally when I first started. I mm -hmm. have S's and P's, and I have their names on it, you know, of who I took it from. So I know that 
I took that S from somebody named whatever in Jericho, which was like mm -hmm. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I, you know, all those things that I keep and I use them because if I need a P or an S or a T or a CH or something like that, I just go and go, no problem, I got it. And it's faster for me to do it a lot of times than sending it back to the editor or the supervisor. Um, a lot of times with my supervisors, I love it. We have a running thing where you try it, I'll try it. Let's see who gets there first and maybe we'll combine the two of the best. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, yeah. And I, re I really appreciate that, Sherry. And, and just to your point, like I will say the character's name, you know, and you can tell if it's male or female, but here's the thing, like if it's a P or a T or something, you're not necessarily going to associate that with that character or also like let's say it's a male p and you need a female p well you could probably just pitch it up tack that bad boy on there and now you've got a female p and the other thing about the magic fills for me um generally it's speaking it's that that? if you name them with whatever show or the character or whatever it's just an identification thing it's like oh yeah, yeah i remember what that sounds like i remember why that grabbed it and it's amazing how many things you can grab and hang on to and remember that you named it that with their name and you remember the characteristic as you're grabbing it it's weird yeah and carol i think you might be referring to i've got two little magic fills in particular i think they're both from scandal um one, i think i have them too <laughs> <laughs> uh one of them is just like scandal 301 movement fill and it's mm -hmm. just this magic piece of movement because i think one of the things that i was not great at when i was first starting out cutting dialogue and sherry could attest to this <laughs> actually um is i i, I would make everything like too cleaned out you know like mm -hmm. we're hermetically seal and i would clean out all the movement and and and, and what i've learned over the years is you got to let things breathe you can't cut out all of the life you got to keep some life so sometimes i will use that magic piece of fill movement fill and it's just the thing you need to help with the adr get into the adr get out of the mm -hmm. adr and there's another one like from scandal like david Ab abby mm -hmm. footstep or something and it is magic because it it's one of those things where it's crazy but no matter what i'm doing what what scene it is what i need if i copy and paste that in i just move it around a little bit and the movement seems to sync with whatever this <laughs> thing <is. laughs> so i would just highly recommend i mean in, in in general fills are best from the scene or the location that mm -hmm. you're working in but it is also good to have stuff just in case but but for me the real you know um icing on the cake the, the thing that really binds things together is the movement mm -hmm. one of the things that i really like about uh your edits and and now i do in my edits is um is i uh, if you have an angle that's particularly hard to match not necessarily because of the acoustic characteristic change but the movement underneath it the amount of cloth etc i can clean a lot of that cloth out on the dub stage but that angle, that edge from that one shot to the other shot where there's cloth and there's not cloth from the other take is a real tell that that angle is there, even if the volume matches, even if the acoustical characteristics match. So you, I've seen you take this magic fill and kind of just go a really long fade and just let it dangle into the Yeah, on another side. track. Yeah, yeah, and it's really been, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> one of the points that we'll, we can talk about a little bit later or now. But one of the things that is really important to edit for editors to know is, and things that are definitely pet peeves for mixers, mm -hmm. is when you have a scene, especially a noisy scene, mm -hmm. that has a lot of cuts in it, and you come up upon it, and you're seeing the, the regions and the lines flowing, and then all you see below it is one line of fill. Oh. <laughs> an entire track of fill. And at that point, I know that I have a crap editor. I'm sorry, but I know that I've got somebody who doesn't understand the art of dialogue editing. Because what we want are those magic fills or the fill that bridges the regions. And we don't want, or at least for me, I don't want rounded fades. I want long fades, flats, you know, flat fades because I'm not trying to get all the sound in, I'm just trying to get a smooth transition between them. And bridging edits with fill is what makes most mixers happy. You can always run a line of fill underneath, even if it doesn't necessarily relate to that scene because it might help once everything else is in there. 
But the important thing is those bridges of those magic fills or fills that you create from that scene or anything, because a lot of times you just need almost a second to get between one scene to another. And if you leave the handles for the mixer, they can drag it out and they can make it smooth. And so Scott, I'm, do you have a little magic folder of, of things that you oh, borrow and, and <laughs> did, did, yeah. So, and and have, the effects side, like do you have a, something similar? Yeah. <laughs> I have three versions of movement tracks. So I have like a, um, a light movement, medium movement, um, heavy movement. Because what always happens is you end up with, um, you have an angle that has all the movement on it, and you cut to the ADR, there's no movement anymore. So I have, along with regular cloth movement, which, which is shot with a Foley, I have this additional thing that I can put in to add a little more grit or movement. Um, one other thought I had with um, dialogue editing, as well as the magic fill you're talking about, is um, if you're familiar with um, RX-7 isotope, product, I'm using Ambience Match and, um, and create an exact fill for that angle. So in that spot where the ADR is along with the movement, if you can create an ambience that is the exact same um, sound and sonically, I end up doing that a lot when I do m &Es, where we, when we remove the production tracks and all we're left with is the sound effects, what you're missing is that nice production tone. And so a lot of, a lot of times created an entire fill of the whole scene so that we have the exact same production fill. And I think in the same way, if you're creating fills for um, ADR, not only to match the, um, the movement of the, of the angle, you want to match that tone exactly. So um, being um, not just creating a, a fill for the entire scene, but creating specific fills for specific angles for ADR lines will go a long way in masking, um, going between angles and takes. I would just... Uh add that that's a fantastic idea but i i ask my dialogue editors to not not start with that because if you start with ambience match it's like a really easy way to do it you know you suck out the dialogue for those of you who don't know and what it leaves behind the ambience but it can tend to sound sterile and it gets better with each incarnation like when we go from our six to seven and hopefully eight nine whatever it gets better every time but it still doesn't have the life and the air in the characteristics exactly of if you do it the old fashioned way, which is to literally suck out all of the dialogue, bring everything together, fade it all out. I mean, it's a painstaking long process, but sometimes what I'll do is I'll do that. And if you can't find Phil, cause there's sometimes where, you know, they roll camera, they're talking immediately. There's no space in between dialogue, you know, absolutely at that point, I will, I'll rely on that. But I might do a combination of things where I'll do the old fashioned way, just to give it some of that life. I'll do an ambient match track to give some of the characteristics of that scene and give me a little more length of the sound and then maybe I'll bounce it or I'll blend it. So I'll do a lot of different things to accommodate that. But I would just say some newer editors just go to that every single time as their first mm -hmm. way to get fill. And I would recommend against using it across the board like that. I think I, think I remember I'm not sure if this was it, but I remember way back at Sony during the analog days, and we were just starting with the workstations. And I remember getting a dialogue edit where the editor said, I just can't, I don't remember who it was, but I just can't find any fill. There is no fill. And I said, come with me. And I went into the back room and we had a four track that was running sound effects, additional sound effects and things like that, that all, that I would sort of put together kind of like a, you know, a little drive of stuff. And I went through there and I just said, okay, come here. And I recorded like a minute of dialogue and I started cutting tape. I just started cutting the tape. Uh -huh. taking it all, just what Marla was saying, cutting out all the dialogue. And I just pasted it together and it went, and then I turned it around backwards and then I turned it around, you know, I did all this stuff. And I showed the editor, editor and I said, I need a second and a half of fill to get through this damn scene. And once <laughs> I have, that's it, it'll work. And so I put it in and they just stood there and they were like, Oh my God. And I'm like, yeah, that's fill. Look at the scene, examine the scene that you're in and see what kind of fill and how much fill you actually need. Because sometimes you can lay that sterile piece of fill on top of a piece that sounds like absolute crap. Right. And it works. And I will just add one more thing. Uh, whenever I cut dialogue, it used to be that like, I would start with scene one and I would just get in there and I try to make that perfect. 
but you kind of run out of time if you do that. So you, I, I feel like I want to do passes, like the first pass, you know, like I'll split. I don't want to get too deep into that right now, but talking about fill, what I found is if I don't beat myself up, if I can't find good fill for scene one right now, I'll just do what I can. I'll make myself a little note. I'll keep cutting because maybe in act four, they're in the same location. And, and in that, in that moment, they don't talk. They look at each other for three seconds or four seconds. Well, great. Now I grab that from there and I go back to scene one and now I rework it with this piece of fill. If I, you know, I could have wasted a lot of time without what I needed and then find it later. And I think that it's important for most editors to realize that noise is not always your enemy. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important lesson to learn is that you don't have to clean up every piece of noise that you hear. Again, it comes down to examining the scene, and your location, and your signal to noise. Absolutely. Yeah, I had a very wise mentor once tell me, smooth is better than clean. <laughs> and sometimes, <laughs> you know, the noise can be justified. I mean, you could like, you know, if, he's not, if a person's not looking at the picture and there's this clunk and they're working and they're working and they're working and they're using spectral and they're trying to paint it out and they're do, trying to do all this stuff. But then, you know, the mixer, Sherry or, or Carol may just like go, go, well, wait, what were they trying to accomplish? They'll go back to the X or the original and somebody set something down in the frame. So it was like not, probably not, not bad. bad. Yeah, it wasn't a bad thing. Yeah. 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 I think yeah, the other thing to do, I know a lot of times I'm sure I'll be working on a scene and say, hey, can you go online for a second if I'm working next to her in headphones? I want to hear how much ambience you got, what's going on here. He goes, oh, I don't need to clean it up that much because um, Foley or backgrounds are covering that up. I don't need to make it that squeaky clean because it's going to play just fine. Indeed. Speaking, we've covered a little bit of this as, we're, as, we, as we've gone back and forth, but let's just uh, define some of our pet peeves, some of the things that really kind of put the brakes on the dub stage productivity. Um, what are some what are things that you would like to see people avoid in the editorial that you receive on stage? <laughs> this is a very requested question. And you know what I love? I love that, that editors were like, just tell us what you don't want us to do, which I love. I love that. I love this question. Yeah. I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to say these days, what we expect on stage, clip game, clip game, clip game. You have clip game. Give us, give us a flow. I hate to be chasing faders on my first pass. It's a waste of time these days. I, I don't need you to mix it for me. I'd rather you not do any RXing or processing and just give me a nice flow so that I can start working on the scene when I get it. The other thing is something that editors tend to do a lot, and they're doing it by the book but I don't want you to do it by the book. Splitting futz is where you hear a bump, they hear a bump, we all hear a bump, and you still split it because that's where the scene crosses. There are ways to accommodate that by um, crossing them at a logical place that sometimes will create a subtle overlap, but the eye doesn't pick that up. Sometimes you cheat it where there is no bump because if you're hearing a bump, we're gonna hear a bump mm -hmm. and we're gonna have to fix it the way that we're asking you to fix it. Um, and you're talking about like when people are in the middle of a word and they like, oh, maybe yeah. they're on a phone. Because nine out of yeah. 10 film editors will cut it in the middle of a word, not on a constant, yeah. in the middle of a, even a hold. And you're looking at them going, why the hell did you do that? Mm -hmm. There are ways to accommodate it. And sometimes you have to cheat it on both sides, yeah. but it won't bump. And the ear, if you're in the story, the ear doesn't perceive it. It goes with the picture and it, you know, it'll actually work for you. Um, yeah. I think that, um, again, my, my thing about bridging fills with regions and um, also I like long tails because another thing that editors will tend to do that to me it doesn't make sense because again it has to be repaired is if, first of all, if you have a long enough tail, the mixer can pull it out. We can even look for alternate takes or alternate reads, but secondary, if there is a reverb on the voice, a natural room ambience on the voice, and you're cutting it and you cut that reverb, that really doesn't help us any because we have to go back in and pull it out and create a way to do it. And a lot of times I've noticed that editors will cut it off so the reverb tail goes away. But if I open it up, and even if I hear almost the slightest bit of the next word coming in, but I put a particular fade on it, mm -hmm. that word isn't there. And so it's giving as much as you possibly can to the mixer 
so that we have the option to work with it. I'm going to yeah. let some other people step in because I have a bunch of others. But yeah. And I'll just know talk all real quick about some dialogue and then some effects. Uh, with dialogue, um, maybe not Sherry, but there are re-recording mixers who don't mind if you do some RX provided a couple things. You know, like like it's better if you kind of manually go through and, and take out ticks and pops, you know, as opposed to just, you know, highlighting 10 seconds and then hit process because you're going to lose some of the authenticity, you're gonna lose the performance, you know, like mm -hmm. there's there's performance in those consonants mm -hmm. and those T's and those P's and stuff. And sometimes um, diction, you can lose, yeah. di make diction yeah. blurry. Right, yeah. Yeah. and the clarity. But if you do process something and, and you think that it's pretty good, I would say two things. One, handle the whole, handle out like five seconds on either side, do it to all of it and then handle back in and then do your fades. And that way, if somebody is you know, Mixer wants to do what Sherry just said, where like, oh, they cut off the reverb, or why did they chop this this way? They handle out, it's been processed, but when they handle out, they have a handle, as opposed to they just process, you know, the whole thing with the fades, and then the Mixer goes to investigate, and they, they can't. So that's one mm -hmm. thing is... And they also have to give, uh, keep the originals in a... Well, that was my way. second okay. thing I was going to say. I didn't that, mention that, but yes. Yeah. So, the sec so that's the first thing is to, to do more than you need and then bring it in to cut. But then either underneath muted with a little orange note or on the X or whatever you've already discussed with the re-recording mixer is the completely raw, unadulterated, here you go. And that way, like it might not sound overcooked to the dialogue editor, but it gets on the stage and with your chain and whatever, you're like, whoa, that is way overcooked. I need go to go back. And then there's other times where it's spot on and they can just kind of move through the edit quickly. And then with effects, I would say two quick things. And that is sometimes effects editors, because they want to really make sure that um, everybody, the effects mixer and the client and the supervisor have all these choices, they'll cut just a ton of stuff they won't mute it. And so like, you know, the kitchen sink just comes at, you know, Scott, as opposed to, okay, yeah, let's give everybody choices, but let's mute some of the alts and let's have it play the way you, the effects editor, thinks it or ADR. works the best. Yeah, same thing with, a, with ADR, ADR, like ADR cutting, cutting the group. Don't just let things stripe across and then make Sherry and Carol have to wade through and figure out, you know, what's going on. Like, make your decisions and then give it to the mixer. And then if the client's like, hey, do you have an alt or I want this and my, that, you guys can go spelunking um, and find something and go, oh, how about this? Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is with effects editors, especially these days, and we're all probably going to keep talking about this, is uh, the temp is the king and everybody loves their temp and they've got temp love and it didn't used to be this way like when we did once and again it was really not about that like you know. we didn't have the six channels well we had a d88 remember bubba right. and the d88 yeah right. um, <laughs> <laughs> but um so everybody wants to get back to the temp so and sometimes what effects editors do is they will, you'll, you'll put in your notes, hey, they like the temp, and they'll grab the AF and they'll put it in their tracks, but they won't clean it. And they'll have like crickets and then a gunshot and then crickets because that's what the picture department did because they don't know any better. Um, so, if, so I would say, again, talk to your fix mixer, but bring up those AFs, clean them up, put fades on them, put them so that they make sense, color code them, so that Scott, for example, can quickly get back to what they did. Because even adding stuff can be a mistake. You know what I mean? So it's not just, oh, we're, we used to have this thing and now we don't have it. But if you've layered on all this stuff on top of what they did, that's also considered a mistake. Because now they can't hear you know, what they want to hear, which is just their stuff, unfortunately. But I, but I always just encourage people, and this is with dialogue and effects, to go with the spirit of the note, meaning, you know, Sherry was talking about how, you know, there's rules and that's great, but you've got to know when to break them. And that's just, that comes with time and experience. So again, like if you're cutting for a futz and they cut right here, the beginning editor is going to think they have to cut right there. But to what Sherry was just saying, well, maybe you need to give it a few frames so that it sounds better. So you have to be empowered to make some of these decisions like that. I want to put a little note in here for our viewers. Um, there was a mention of X tracks. 
um, for those that are not familiar with extracts, extracts are typically tracts that are not meant to necessarily be used, but may contain information that are useful to the mixer. Um, so in other words, if you found an alt that you thought really worked for a flubbed line or a, or a bump on a line, you might have the original on the extract in case they don't like the read of that alt or even an alt, another alt that you found that might be better. Um, or maybe a mic that, oh, this boom was really good, but we've been on law of the whole scene and the boom wasn't good for the rest of that, but it's good right here. Maybe you want to go back to the boom those type of things, an optional resource, but these are inactive tracks that are delivered as kind of bonus material. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm just getting back to, real quick to like the spirit of the note that I was talking about. Um, with dialogue, I think if you're a new dialogue editor, you, you may not be as tuned into performance as you should be as you go on in your career. And what I mean by that is, you may think you've got a great alt, and you do as far as sound quality, but you're very zoomed in and you're like, oh, this one has a clunk, this one doesn't. I've made the sink, you know, to their lips. We're golden. Okay, yeah. we're golden, except for the fact that this has a completely different performance. So I encourage and I work with my dialogue editors to think in terms of performance. So if you find a, a dialogue alt that's the exact same performance, great, put that in first position, unmuted, put what they did muted in the X or just in the X unmuted, um, you know, and you're good to go. But if it's slightly different, then you might keep what they did with the clunk and then have your alt underneath with a note that says, nice alt, different read or different performance mm -hmm. or something. And that way, you know, it's not the end of the world if there's still a clunk in the line because the picture editor picked that tape. So then mm -hmm. when everybody's on the dub stage and somebody's like, oh, there's a clunk in that line, Carol or Sherry can say, oh, you know, I have an alt. It says there's a slightly different performance, but let's check it out. And then everybody can decide together whether they want to do that. And also doing it that way really shows that you care about their decisions, you know, and the sanctity of the performance that they chose as opposed to, oh, this doesn't have a clunk. I'm putting this one in. It sounds better. Well, yeah, but they may be attached, really attached to that read. There's also a question that I love that was just brought up in the chat. Um, uh, should you always keep the original version in the X track if you RX a clip? I think you'll find across the board the answer is, Sherry, can you help me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Please, yes, yes, yes. I've, I've, had, yeah. <laughs> I've, had, I've, had, I've, I've actually had, I mean, I do let people RX for me. I have a couple of people that I trust explicitly, but even them, occasionally I have to send them what I've done because they took out too much noise. They got a little overzealous. But I have had some editors that, aside from the extracts, gave me an exact, if they did a lot of RXing, they gave me an exact duplicate of all my tracks, like six or seven tracks of just the dialogue raw, top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And then they went and did their stuff. This way they knew I was covered and I didn't care that I had extracts plus those. I always knew that I could grab the original real fast if I needed. So yes, never assume that what you're doing is perfect. <laughs> Back it up. Back it up because a mixer will get their hands on it. And uh, uh, yes, wait, so that's not usually a dialogue editor. Yes, that is a dialogue editor, uh, editor task um, to give you the raw plus the processed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and again, you know, and you can never say guess your mixer's ears. Yeah, and also getting back to what something that Scott said, if you might make it super, super clean, and you might not have had to. So now you've compromised the dialogue. But when Scott joins the party, you didn't even really need to take out all that noise. So mm -hmm. that you know, that's an instance where you did it because you're dialogue editor and you wanted to make it as clean as possible. But if Sherry or Carol has the original, they may grab that and put it in, bring a little more of that life back. And then again, when Scott's Foley and effects come in, it's just a non-issue. I've definitely found that a similar treatment and philosophy in, in dialogue mixing has yielded a much better or worse result as a result of the skills of the mixing of my sound effects mixer. The sound effects mixer is key in making dialogue sound fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> it, it truly is. Um, there's a, a follow-up question to the kind of pet peeves that I think is um, a really interesting. Um, should you save, uh, or, or, or should you, um, excuse me, 
Um, the question is, uh, should you worry about cutting things very closely together? So can you explain if there's a problem in mixing when two tracks are butted up together that are drastically different? And I think this applies to both dialogue and to sound effects, right, Scott? Yeah, actually, um, I want to go back just a little bit to talk about oh, sure. some um, pet peeves with uh, sound effects specifically. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them are, a lot of them are similar to what you have in, um, in dialogue. Um, the first thing I would tell my editors to be um, organized because the worst thing is to get a bunch of tracks that are lumped together and there's no sort of rhyme or reason where they put the door closes and where they put the cars and where they put the background. So we talk a lot about food groups. Well, things should be cut in food groups. Um, the simplest are, you know, sound effects, hard effects, um, backgrounds, foley. Those are the three main ones, but then need to break them down into smaller groups. So um, typically... Um, I like editors to cut more in film style where we have groups of pre-dub tracks. So I organize them in, um, you know, effects A, B, C, D, E, F, and those might have like um, monos and stereos in those. And the first set of tracks might have like the, um, the door closes and the specific hard effects. And then as they move down, they might have, you know, the, car, the cars are all in one track. Or if they're in a gun battle, it might be, you know, the first actor who's um, shooting on this tra set of tracks in here. And then I have VCAs that I can mix those together. So organizing so that it's easy for me to see how they're lay laid out and they're grouped together. And then when we get down to backgrounds, um, sort of um, confirming the fact that we don't want things butted together. I don't like scenes cut um, that are butted together. So I like to have like an A, B, C, and even D group of tracks for background. So scene A is going to be the interior and then we cut to the B set of tracks that's going to be the exterior and then back to the A track and stuff. And if, um, if an editor is organized enough to go through their session before they start and find out that this same interior happens at one minute and it happens at 10 minutes and it happens at tw you know, 30 minutes, um, he can actually cut all those things at the same time and be sure that they're not only consistent with the sounds that they use, but they're consistent with the tracks that they're laid on so that when I'm mixing, I can actually mix the first scene and I can use those same settings on the next time it happens. So organization is huge in that, that way that it helps me so that, you know, that's one of my biggest things is I'm, I'm, I actually do that. I go through this, um, the session when I first start and if the editor hasn't, I put markers on all the scenes so I know what the scene is. That way, when I'm doing my pre-dub, I want it to sound consistent through the show. And if they've done their job and they have consistent sound, I can apply those same treatments to those same scenes. So um, keeping organized and keeping it consistent helps me a lot as well. And also, I like what you said, um, Marla, about um, cutting too many effects. Too many effects is not necessarily better. Just cut some good effects. Cut me a few good effects. <laughs> And that'll be great. If it's a gunshot, for instance, I, I get this so often where, well, if I cut five sounds for the gunshot, it's going to sound bigger and louder, right? Uh -huh. No. I end, up clean, I end up having to weed it out. So I find the one or two or three sounds that sound good, and I use those and I mute the rest. Well, do me a favor when you cut them, pick the one or two that you like and leave them on muted and give me some alternates below so that I can add to those if I need to. And then I think the last point I want to make is um, everything we do has to play with and underneath um, the production track because the production track is what's going to happen. So if I have a, um, a noisy scene in traffic in New York City and my sound effects editor cut a bunch of washes of traffic and all this kind of stuff, um, all it's going to do is muck up the dialogue and make it um, sound noisier. So what an editor needs to do is to listen to the production track first and see what is there and then cut things that are going to cut through all that. Um, that big traffic wash probably won't work unless it's an ADR scene and we need to replace that. They need to give me some specific carboys and some horn, horn hawks and some things that are going to um, add detail to um, the scene without mucking up or getting in the way of, of the dialogue. In addition to that, um, in the case of Foley, um, the editor needs to cut with the guide track so that um, it be sure, he, uh, be sure that everything is cut in sync. So if there's uh, footsteps, for instance, which happens a lot in production dialogue, the Foley is in sync with that so that I have the option of playing it in addition to the production or if I have to replace it when there's, um, there's ADR. So being aware of um, 
what's in production and what the role is of sound effects along with production um, goes a long ways to making our job easier mixing. And just to further uh, with the food groups, because we had a couple of questions about the confusion as to what food groups refer to. Mm -hmm. Do you also like to have food groups in how your backgrounds are delivered? And as an offset to that question, do you like something delivered for 5.1 than you do for, say, a stereo mix or Atmos in your backgrounds? Yeah, that, yeah those, are, those, are, those are great questions. Um, I do probably prefer uh, having scenes over splitting types of sounds. So... Um, it, but in the case of like, if I have a, a, a scene that's in, uh, that has a bunch of crowds in it, I want those crowds separated because I may want those isolated for the foreign version, or I might just want it on a separate VCA so that I can change it a little different. Um, or it's possible that, um, if there happens to be a lot of birds, maybe we split that out, but, um, yeah, definitely, um, you can split things out more, uh, with BGs and those sort of things, but, um, I would say more separation and food groups on effects than I would for, um, for BGs. Excellent. And uh, delivering oh. five, one to you is different than stereo or, or is that pretty much in your world to it surround is. eyes and, or uh, stereo that? I think the, um, I think the, what people need to understand is what we're doing here. When we mix in stereo, what def defines stereo is, um, different information on the left speaker and the right speaker that defines stereo. If you have, have everything coming out the center, it's not giving you true stereo. Well, in, in immersive audio or 5.1 audio, we need to differentiate between the front of the room and the back of the room. So if you're cutting for 5.1, I need to have material that I can pan to the left and the right. And I also need to have material that I can pan front, um, from front to the back. So uh, for instance, can I show you my screen for one second, just for fun? Yeah. I have a session up here that I thought would be kind of fun to, um, to share with you guys. Um, I have a session here that um, was a recent show that I worked on. And um, this was for 5.1, but I'm going to just um, zoom in on these. Um, well, my computer got really slow with, uh, with all this Zoom stuff going on. I want to just zoom in on these uh, background tracks here for a second. So this um, editor for this scene... Um, this is a, a scene on Hollywood Boulevard, so there's some tra traffics and, and that sort of thing. So um, he cut me a couple of, um, of mono um, sort of ambient tracks, um, a couple more that had a little more movement with some traffic and stuff, and then a couple of the stereo things. And if you look what I did in the mix, you can look at my, my panning on the left side here. I took those first two mono fills and panned them hard left surround and hard right surround so I had some sound coming from behind me. I took these other two mono tracks which had a little movement and I cut them sort of uh, midway uh, left and right front. And then I took the stereo tracks and I cut one of them uh, stereo to uh, stereo surround left and right and then one of them to the front left and right. And the reason I wanted to show that to you is, is um, giving enough material so you can do that. So I like having things that balance each other. So if you give me some bird tracks, I want to have enough birds so I can put some on the left and I can put some on the right. If I have fills or traffics, I want to have enough so I can put some in the front and some in the back. And it's not always a stereo track that works. Sometimes multiple monos that we can place in places sound better than having just a stereo track that I pan to the left and right you get a better effect if you hear a different sound in different places. So um, having multiple things to choose from gives us more options, especially as you get into more immersive audio with, um, with Atmos and stuff where there's more channels. Um, we need a few more choices. Your, your background tracks are going to get a little wider so that we have um, choices of what to put in those speakers when we're mixing in uh, multiple formats. So really, it sounds like more like you, you get a uh, more sounds to play with, with maybe more immersive formats, but not necessarily 5-1 tracks or more, uh, I, I guess, seven one four tracks or what have to play with. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I actually don't, I don't like getting multi-channel tracks, 5-1s and 7-1s. I've got them before where um, they've taken it from another stage or something, and they aren't always placed where I want them. And sometimes um, they'll have like a you know, some specific sound that ends up in all the speakers. And I don't, I don't want that. So I'll, I'll end up putting um, like a spanner plug-in on some of those so I can repan those how I want them. 
or split them back out to mono. So I, I would actually prefer monos and stereos mm -hmm. for those sorts of things. And, and just a rule of thumb with that too is um, if it's a hard, a specific hard effect, um, a stereo effect isn't always the right choice. For instance, with cars, I would rather have mono tracks cut for cars than I would a stereo car effect because uh, splitting them to the left and right channel just makes it sound wide. I want that to be in a, a location where I can place it. So um, I'd rather have a specific hard effects cut as monos and maybe things that are design effects or traffics that might have more of a, a left right feel. Mm -hmm. Give me some stereos on those and then let the stage decide where those things are going to be panned. Do you like things to be pre-panned from your editor or no? I, I usually never um, import panning into my session because um, I find that it doesn't really ever translate from the mm -hmm. edit room to the stage. So I prefer to do my own panning. Okay. I think what I, what I do like, um, like as in dialogue, um, I like to have good clip gain so that they present to me what they think it should sound like. So I can hear, a, um, listen to the, the scene of backgrounds and I can do an overall level adjust so that it's, they, they present to me how they want it to sound. Then I can dig in and do details on different tracks. But um, I think um, clip gaining from the editor uh, standpoint so that it's not just a wall of sound that hits me. I have an idea of what the sound designer's intentions are so that then I have a chance to spend more time being creative and mixing than I do trying to sort out what, where that track came from and pulling this down and um, figuring out what's going on in the, in the scene. And uh, actually, somebody had asked exactly that, like, how do they effectively communicate to their effects mixer what their intention is to their sound? And it sounds like clip gain is the answer. But um, they also asked, how do you let your sound effects uh, mixer know that you intend something to simply be an LFE enhancement? Well, um, I've had this very case, and um, I've talked to my editor, and typically they just, we just make an LFE track. Because I'm going um, to send that differently than what I would a, a track that pans in the spectrum. Typically, um, I use 5.0 panners on all my effects, and then I use, um, I use a send for the LFE. Um, and if they give me an LFE-only track, I'll send it only to LFE. So that would be the, the way to label that. Um, in addition, I'm a big fan of, um, of um, region groups and labeling tracks. So mm -hmm. if I have a complicated scene with five people shooting guns all at each other, they can region, region group the set of tracks that this is actor A, this is actor B, this is their gun, their group of tracks, or a car chase. They can differentiate yes. those, region group those, and label it so I know what's going on. Um, I don't even mind um, markers, although I prefer to use markers for my workflow. So I think the um, labeling tracks and region groups within um, the edit session is great. Um, also, they can even put a region group on its own, a blank region group, and label them, let me know what's going on in the scene. They can give me as many um, notes as they can, because we don't have cue sheets anymore. We're, we're basically going off the feedback, what we have in Pro Tools now. So this actually brings me to something that I think is common in both dialogue and uh, dialogue music and uh, effects, which is um, identifying how the mixer thinks of their food groups. So uh, I, I would imagine uh, Scott and, and please Sherry and, and Marla, please jump in. Um, I know I do this. I provide kind of a general template or at least notes as to like how many tracks I like to work with or, you know, how I like things split out. If I like a FUTS track or I don't, I'm not a FUTS track girl. I like, you know, colored uh, uh, regions to tell me, you know, a particular color to say this should be FUTS. Um, you know, I like, you know, group separate here, but specific group separate from main group. Like, what do you guys communicate in your templates and how do you get your templates to your editors? Like, well, it's like I said, to, I said before, um, I have a sheet. I actually have a one sheet that I send out to all my supervisors before I start. And that explains everything. And then I ask for the dialogue, dialogue editor's phone number, or they will ask for mine and I will explain it in further detail. I personally contact the effects editor, I mean the, the music editor and the dialogue editor as soon as I get on a show and they're assigned. Mm -hmm. um, that gives you your best chance. It's kind of like a cinematographer for an actor um, or a director of photography. Your editors make you look good or bad. And so the combination of communication and getting them your information or as early on as possible is the best way to ensure that your session will go smoothly. 
Yeah, and it's it's amazing how big a variety there is in opinions and what mixers want. You know, like some mixers are fine by angle, just split the dialogue by angle, and others want it by character, even if the characters are in the same take and the same track, you know, virtually together. So in that instance, they want you to not do a whole lot of work, but just split it, make a little phase, I mean, a little uh, fade, make sure it's not phasing, but just like, you know, split it by character because they want to EQ differently. And, and some mixers don't like that. So, and, and also the amount of tracks vary. You know, like I worked on one show where there was like eight different tracks for FUTs because it was a, a show that took place in the 40s and there were different types of radios, you know, like a Victrola or radio out of like an old fashioned car, you know, and so he, we just had all these FUTs tracks for the different radios um, that recurred kind of on an ongoing basis in that episode. You know, there's a variety of how many extracts can we have? How many PFX tracks can we have? So it, it really need to iron all that stuff um, you know, before you start. And I just wanted to touch back before I forget on one thing that Scott kind of mentioned, that's one of my pet peeves, and that is um, for effects editors to top production, meaning if there's a door closed in production, you need to like zoom in and get that subframe accurate basically, so that when they play together, it's one sound. Because sometimes the dialogue is not you know, exactly, exactly in sync. I mean, it might be out by a frame or two frames, which, you know, we can get into the politics of all that later, but you really need, yeah. <laughs> I see you laughing. You really need to top that production. Otherwise, what happens is if the effects editor, you know, is rolling the picture and goes, what well, actually shuts right on this, you know, frame, puts it there and then everything's playing together and you hear boom, boom. Right, so, mm -hmm. so you hear this kind of flanging. Now, for Foley, generally for TV shows, we don't have the luxury of having somebody cut the Foley, but if you're working in features, I used to have the opportunity to supervise Foley for features, and when you're cutting Foley for features, everything down to the footsteps. Like if you hear footsteps in production, you know, maybe it'll be cut out, maybe it won't, so you need to really line that stuff up so it doesn't double up. And also it's when you're cutting fully for features, it gives you a clue. And what I mean by that is if we're not looking at a shot where we can see somebody's footfalls, you might be going kind of on their shoulders, you know, and their body language. Um, and that can be a little tricky for, for cutting fully, but if you hear something in production, you're like, okay, got it. Now I'm kind of in that mode. How do people, how do their editors, or your editors deliver to you? Do they consolidate their sessions and save a copy as? Do they refer to files and just include new <laughs> files? Like, how do you like to receive, like, what's file management practice? Yeah. Asking me or Sherry? Well, uh, either one of you, really. Well, but, I would just yeah. say two, two quick things about this. When I'm first setting up a project, like if I'm editing something, I do this little trick where I'll grab, like, the assembly icon of the Pro Tools, I'll drag it into a new folder. And then any audio files that I create, you know, like I consolidate something or I do any processing, that'll just be in that audio file folder. So then when I do backups, like let's say I'm cutting over like seven days or something, I'll just throw the icon on my desktop and just that audio files folder that's not very big there. So that in the ongoing thing as a save, I'm not save copying every single time. I'm just updating the edit and whatever the audio files are. And then if you're, but generally speaking, I would say if you're involving other people, like let's say now you have to give your session to the main dialogue editor that's gonna incorporate your act, or then once that person's done, they're gonna give it to Sherry or to you. My philosophy, even though it does involve a lot more duplicate files and you know, it can be a little cumbersome, is to just go ahead and bite the bullet and do a save session copy in, and that way, Nobody on the setup of the dub stage, whether whether it's a mixed tech or you guys are going, Marla, I need this file. I can't find the Pro Tools can't find this file. You know, <laughs> that like <laughs> maddening. So that's my recommendation. But I do have a special eye roll I've developed for Pro Tools can't find this file. I'm like, <laughs> I understand why like when you clear out the region, like it doesn't all just do it right the first time. Like you have to do it several times. It's like, yeah. It's beautiful. You know, I would I would I would second that about um, copying files 
I think anytime you go uh, from editorial to the dev stage, especially nowadays since we're, we're posting most of the stuff on a server, um, save session copy. So every single file you use in there, whether it's a sound design, it might end up on your desktop somewhere. You, we don't know. Save session copy, it solves most of the problems of finding those files. And then zip that file before you post it. That way it, it um, keeps your, um, the integrity of your Pro Tool session and everything intact. And then post it on the server. And then when it gets to dub stage, you, study, stage, you have at least a uh, fighting chance of everything uh, locking up and finding <laughs> yeah, all the files. Yeah, I learned that recently with the music session that we went through on the film. Um, Sherry, can you talk about your template and what you ask for from your music and your dialogue editors? Like, what, what is your layout, your sure. food groups? I mean, it depends, again, once uh, once I speak to the dialogue editor, I mean, to the effects editor, the music editor, I can decide <laughs> what I'm going to get um, and how I'm going to lay it out. Because I've gotten sessions where they'll send me, like, four LCRS and then two five ones. And then a bunch of stereo stems. Sometimes it's all just stereo stems. Uh, sometimes it's uh, it varies. So I need to know what they're set up to do and what they like to do. If they want to just send me five ones, I tell them to send me a bunch of five ones, so I have the ability to get into and out of certain things. Um, another thing that I tend to do, I ask them to to put together a stereo track that will remain muted in my session. I call it my cheat track since. You can only have so many things on the top face and so many things visible if you want to be able to see what's going on. I create, I usually just, if they don't send it to me, I'll just copy, you know, option click up to one track, one region from every queue, including the futzes, including the songs, including everything. And I put it up there muted just so that I could see what's coming in and coming out so I'm not surprised when a piece of music comes in because I can't see it on my screen at the moment. And this way I never get nabbed by anything really heavy. Um, I'll lay it out. My at my typical show has music, you know, 24 stereo faders, whatever, either an A and a B group or all in one. Um, I delineate between futzes and songs as songs being part of uh, things that are played full score and then go into futz. They'll go on my futz tracks. Um, and I run everything via VCA grouper, one or two groupers to VCAs. And that's basically keeping everything at zero VU the way that the composer wanted it. Mm -hmm. But again, it, you know, and then I can go in and vary instruments. I'd rather bring down an instrument than lower an entire cue. Um, there are many different layouts, but it just depends. That's why communication early on with your music editor is important. As far as my dialogue template, I'm very fussy in the way that I like my dialogue <laughs> set up. And I will spend an hour if I have to getting it to where I want it if somebody doesn't follow it. Um, I'm not somebody who likes every scene split up on different sets of faders. I don't care what it is, as long as the preceding last line is not on the same track as the incoming new line especially if there's reverb or something like that that I'm adding to it or I'm coming out of. Um, I'll go as wide as I need to. I usually have a couple of FUTS tracks on. We did a show called Unreal where I had six FUTS tracks because we were doing different views of television screens in different rooms, plus headphone FUTSes, plus all different kinds of FUTSes. Just depends on what show, show I'm working on. Um, I don't care. And my biggest, the thing that I'm very intense about is I want every ADR alt carried with me. So that can involve a lot. Um, I usually go ADR one through eight and the top four are the ADR selects. And I'll tell you where that came from. Back in the old days, when we were not on Pro Tools, we were working on a Harrison series, whatever, series 10, I think it was at Sony. And we had an A and a B side to the module. And a lot of the consoles had that, the analog consoles. They had an A and a B side. So we would have the supervisor put the selects on one, two, three, four, and then five through eight would be the corresponding alternate takes. So we could hit A or B switch. So I still like them on my top four. And I'm somebody who would like, if channel one has ADR select, channel two would be alt muted, three would be alt muted, four would be alt muted, five through eight. If there's 40 takes, I don't care. I want them down at the bottom. B 
because I tend to go mining through for inflections and pieces and I'll put together whatever I have to put together to try to save production or to make the ADR work. So if something's on channel two for the, alt, the ADR select, channel one should be an alt muted. And as long as it's muted, I know that that's a mute, yeah, an alt. But if it's open, it's a select. And if they're stereo channels, I ask them to give me the one that they believe is the one that closely matches the dialogue around it, the production around it, and mute the others. And so I may only have two takes in my first four tracks and only one channel is open, but I know that it's boom, lob, boom, lob, and keep them the same in that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I just tell, I tell my editors to put all of the ADR, I call them raw tracks. And sometimes there can be 40 or 50 takes of something, and I don't care. I just gang them up. I mean, I don't take the 40 tracks. I take the 40 tracks in and consol consolidate them down to like five or 10 tracks, just putting them next to me. Because at that point, they're not edited anyway, and I'm doing the editing on it. So a lot of times, I'm, I'm very specific because I, I don't want to see blank spaces on my ADR. I want to see them full if there is alternate takes. And I hate seeing you know something on channel one and then channel five, and there's nothing on two, three, and four. It's like, why? Those are tracks that can be utilized. It's Pro Tools. It's not like the old analog days when we were all rolling together, which was really a pain. We were mm -hmm. all rolling together, and if you stopped, you had to go back, you know, and you didn't even have the, the total automation to be able to do it. So now it's like you can stop any time on your own and reset and apply automation. So I don't care how close things are in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need each character on a different. I, I, I love seeing all my ADR on channels one and two, or one, mm -hmm. two, three, four, you know, just ganged up so that they're in my visual on my top layer. Like I said, I have a template layout that I send out to my supervisors and I'll gladly, if anybody wants to email me, I can send them a copy of the sheet that I send to my people, my dialogue editors, and I'd share it with you and no problem. So just feel free to send me an email and I'll send, I'll send it out to you. I'm wondering if I might um, assert myself a little bit here. I, I've often had a couple of conversations through my mixing with editors where they've referred to, oh, well, it's on the such and such track. And and they go they, they and then they say well you don't you don't keep my tracks and I think to myself I was like I can't keep your tracks like it's not it's not a personal thing but the process of mixing requires me to set up a system where tracks are grouped and they deliver themselves to the recorder in a manner which we can split out separate things for deliverables as well as monitor the sum so I I can't bring in your tracks I have to take your material and bring it up to my template. And it's not, it's not personal. It's, it's about spigots. It's about signal flow. Yeah. yeah I, I had a, um, I had thought about that communicating with the editor on what they deliver to the stage. And um, for me with sound effects, especially when you're running into hundreds of tracks is that um, before we start, we come up with a template. Um, if it's an experienced editor and he um, has a certain way he likes to work, I'll go with his template because he might like to cut a certain way and I'm okay with that. I'll adapt yeah. my template to match his. If it's, if it's um, someone I haven't worked with before, I'll say use mine. And um, the biggest thing um, is track labeling. I want the tracks to be labeled exactly the same because I want to be able to match the tracks and pull them into my session. I don't want to have to be worried about, oh, well, these are the mm -hmm. mono A effects, and the, but they're labeled um, effects A instead of A Right, effect. right. Um, those are the things we communicate before we start. So we'll do an exchange of... Um, Pro Tool session, if they don't have one, I send them mine. It says, here's what I, mm -hmm. I typically like. This is the effects. Here's the backgrounds. Here's the Foley. Here's my ad effects or wall tracks. Mm -hmm. If you can cut it within here, that's great. And then they might get back to me and say, well, I really um, would rather cut like this. And if I think it's a good idea, it's good. Mm -hmm. But then we establish it for the show. And especially on a series, you want to establish so, so that the series has exactly the same thing. And when it's the first day of the mix and... Um, you're having server problems and the um, everything's being delivered at 10 minutes to nine because we had problems. <laughs> Never happened. I want to be able to, yeah. <laughs> I want to be able to um, import the tracks and match the tracks and mm -hmm. zip them into my session and start working. Cause uh, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the biggest thing to, um, to stop efficiency is trying to find the right sound effects and put them on the right tracks. Um, 
when if everything is streamlined and organized, it can save a lot of time. And, a lot and of also that. character limitations. Like I get a lot of things that are very detailed notes in track names from music editors that I haven't had the opportunity to work with or they came on late or what have. And they, they'll deliver something and, it'd be, and they'll be like, well, it's on or Orchestral 6. And I'm like, all right, well, Orchestral 6 is more than six characters. So if, if I were using that track, all I would see is Orchest for like, do you know what I mean? Like I don't, I can't. I ha now I have to bring it up and relabel it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the the labeling is it, there's a there's a, a actual console functionality to the labeling as well. And also, <laughs> I could, I could go back. Just quickly, with, just quickly with music tracks. Um, if I have one or two tracks, you know, if they send me a lot of additional tracks, a lot more than I'm used to, and I'm trying to cut down on some tracks because I may have more tracks than something else that I need, I'll just take certain tracks and just put them on blank tracks in the music. So I'm not looking at, you know, whether it's uh, synth one, two, or three, all the way on the left in my labeling. I'm looking at the track name. So I just want it really concise so that yep. when I turn on that name, I go, oh yeah, I know where that is. Yep. And, you know, I can get rid of 10 tracks sometimes by consolidating that way because there are so many blank tracks in my music mm -hmm. stems. There's also sometimes a limitation in the um, capability of the equipment. Exactly. And depending on what stage you're on, we may be on a brand new stage that has the latest and greatest HDX3 and we don't, tracks and voices are not a problem. But um, that's why it's important to communicate with an effects editor, especially says, okay, you can't use 100 tracks for BGs and you can't give me, <laughs> um, you know, all these 5-1 tracks because um, yeah, not yeah. just those tracks, it takes horsepower to run my plugins. I have to have DSP in order to run the reverbs and to route everything to the recorder and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's important so that the editor knows the limitation of how many tracks he can cut right. and um, give him those guidelines before we start to make sure that we can play his tracks when we get to the stage. I just wanted to jump in on something that Sherry reminded me. She was talking about presenting the ADR and picking the best mic and, and all of that. Um, that reminds me in both dialogue and ADR, one of my pet peeves is people who don't make the track subframe accurately phased, you know, like dead nuts in sync with each other. In other words, whether it's on the set or on the, AD, on the ADR stage, just the mechanics and the physics of stuff is such that, you know, the boom mic and the lav might be four subframes out from each other. And sometimes you even need to invert the phase. And when you zoom in and you manually, you can do it manually, you know, line up the peaks and let's say the other one is like that and when you invert it if you undo and redo you can hear it going from thin and either phasing or slightly yeah thin and fat and luscious and beautiful and yeah, yeah. there's a software called um auto align post um that will do that for you which is amazing and you should also use that in your dialogue because and this is a whole other thing, whether to use the mix track or not use the mix track, or, you know, once you're adding a lot of um, different mics, at the point where you're, you have more than one mic going, you have to make it sub absolutely 100% aligned. Um, and then, because I will use a lot of tricks, even in the matching of the ADR, where I'll do like a long crossfade, like let's say, you know, a scene, you're, you're able to use the booms for a while, and then suddenly, the boom is in Kansas and you've got to go to the body mics, which you want to avoid at all costs, but you have to. And then later in the scene, you're able to use the booms again. So I may need to slowly transition using both mics, you know, and do it in such a way that Sherry or Carol can undo my fade or whatever I did. But like I'll make a real slow length transition going between mics. And I may even do that with the uh, ADR between the boom and the body mic in order to have it match and same thing. So in order to try any of those fancy tricks, these things have to be dead. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. We hear yeah. the phasing, even if you don't hear it in the editorial yeah. room, we will hear the phasing immediately and have to choose one or the other or get, a, get somebody else to auto align for us. And I have actually, a, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just had a little plug for, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's some expensive programs that line th these things up. If I could put a little plug for um, Absentia DX, which uh, not only is good for noise and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. they actually now have a, um, a, a phase synchronization um, module in there that will do that sort of thing. So oh, really? I um, it's, it's brand new. It's sort of in the beta phase right now. I, but, I um, absolutely love that tool. 
So yeah. it, it also does some things like you can get rid of, um, you know, generator EMI noises and that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. And the other thing, back to what we were talking about creating fills, um, they have a new thing in there um, called Aerotone Generator, which um, it'll, it takes a while to process, but it'll actually um, put some of the PFX and stuff back in there when it removes the dialog. So it sort of helps to make a better fill than just a, a sterile fill. So uh, that's a good, not a real expensive product, but a very um, effective product that might be helpful for dialog editors. Excellent. And that actually, this brings me, um, as we're talking about processing and, and plugins and all that kind of help, um, that brings me to a whole other uh, block of questions that were submitted um, concerning processing. Um, and the, there's a bunch of specifics here, but mainly it, people are trying to determine when they should process, when they shouldn't. Are there things they should not be processing, like broadband noise reduction? Are there things they should avoid? Are there things they should definitely do? Where do you guys sit on processing? Who wants to start? Don't worry, Sherry. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm in the middle of something. Go ahead. We're sending something back. Scott, oh, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I, can, I can talk about sound effects because we, yeah, the, the we get this a lot where um, a sound designer wants to apply reverb or they want to do some cool effect and all that kind of stuff. Um, reverb is the one thing that I, I really don't like baked in because there's no way to unwind it. We're sort of stuck with it. So if you're And a, you can't sound, spatialize it. You can't spatialize it. And I'll, I'll get a track where they put a cool reverb on it and they leave it on a mono track. It's like, well, yeah. that doesn't help me any. Or even a stereo track, I can't really do anything to put it into the space. So um, if they want to give me a process track and then leave me the, um, the, the raw one, that's the same thing with dialogue so that I have the chance to unwind that. Um, as far as um, noise reduction and that kind of stuff, you typically don't deal with that much with sound effects. Um, I have seen cases where um, Foley's been processed if it's noisy, and that's um, not a bad idea if there's some uh, issues with the stage, if, if it's noisy. Um, the other thing I would say is with background tracks, a lot of times um, I end up having to filter out low frequencies where stuff is too boomy or there's a lot of hiss in the track. Um, if, um, if a sound designer is, um, feels confident with that, I don't mind them taking out some of those rumbles or the high frequencies or um, I typically find um, a lot of background tracks end up having hums in them. And of course, they're 60 cycle, they're 60 hertz or 120 hertz. And I notch them out. Um, a lot of times if I find the same effect file in a series, it happens all the time. I'll say, hey, can you just take this file and notch 120 hertz out of that file forever? Um, <laughs> those, are, those are good things. But in general, um, um, I prefer tracks sort of on process and stuff for sound effects. Yeah, and I would say in general, we don't do noise reduction for the re-recording mixer because then it ties their hands. The only time that I might do something like that is if something works great, like on one take, there's an airplane and I use dialogue isolate and it's like magic and the plane goes away, then I might like puff out my chest and like present that track and then, <laughs> you know, underneath do the raw one and say, I, and I'll say what I use. I'll say dialogue isolate, take plane out, raw underneath and then you know a lot of times they'll be like great okay that worked or there's something that they they have in mind that i didn't you know realize and so they'll go you know what okay i want to not take out quite as much because of something else mm -hmm. i think i think that the golden rule is if again it'll vary with every mixer for me if i know the editor and i've worked with them before or even if i haven't I'll say, or how familiar are, familiar are you with these devices, with RX, Absentia, you know, anything. And if they say very, I say, okay, give me your best shot on what you, what you can do with the tracks, but make sure you give me the raw tracks underneath. Um, this way I'm protected and they're protected as well. Um, but I don't, I don't mind editors doing processing as long as they're smart about it. And as long mm -hmm. as they're, as long as I can trust their ears. I have a couple of editors who nine, 99% of the work they send my way, it's such an aid, it's such a help. And then there's that couple of percentage, you know, they'll try it on the first couple of things and I just, you know, I say thank you, but I think you're better off just dealing with the little stuff and giving me mm -hmm. my clip gain and a great edit and I'll be very happy, I can take it from there. And um, 
you know, processing is something that is very individual, just like the way all mixers hear. Each mixer hears a little differently and processes a little differently, which is what makes us all special in our own, you know, our own way. Um, but one thing that I can say I have found declicking is something for me that should be used on clicks. Um, or when you really get to know RX, you know that there are certain things just like, you know, movement, you know, de-movement or de, you know, rustle and all that. You can use on all kinds of things when you know what they do. But a lot of editors will de-click an entire scene. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're taking the life out of the movement. Again, the way that Scott and I work, he and I both take PFX tracks. Mine are muted. His are active. Occasionally I'll look at him and go, hey, don't play the PFX from this point to this point because there's a lot of movement that needs some drastic filtering and I'll mm -hmm. take care of doing that. And so he'll mute those and I'll pull it up from my track because sometimes the production is what I want to hear in there. The fill is good, the movement is good and the movement is the life and the transparency of the scene even though there's no dialogue happening. And if a editor takes out all the declicks it for all that little bit of music uh, movement snaps or pops they're not really snaps or pops they're just the movement if they level that all out it takes out the transparency and the transient response and as soon as i hear it i know that they've done it mm -hmm. you know i know that the life from the scene is gone and i'm very very sensitive to it so the key to processing for an editor is don't overdo it. And again, it's ears. The mixers are not the only ones that have to have ears and critical ears. The editors have to these days. They can't just be cutters. A cutter is not a dialogue editor or an effects editor or a music editor. An editor is somebody that really has the skills to listen and to hear. So that's a general I, I had a, a thought I wanted to go back. You were talking about PFX and, and the fact that we both carry the PFX. And the reason it's nice for the effects mixer to have the PFX is um, typically there'll be a sound, there'll be a door close, it'll be in production, it'll be a hard effect, and then Foley will do something. So all those things will be, I'll have three of the same sounds and I have to decide which one to use. And it's much easier for me to, um, to use them and, and, um, and decide which one to use. But in the case where there's something where there's some production noise, I actually have RX on my effects side because I'm, I might need to clean up that effect so I can, I can use it myself. So, um, you know, the, RX is not just a tool that dialogue editors and mixers use. It's something we can use in effects too. Um, but in general, if, um, if we're talking about um, dialogue editors splitting out PFX, um, if there's long uh, sections of movement, leave it in the dialogue track don't split it off as PFX. The only thing that should be split off for PFX are specific um, hard effect things, a door close, or maybe it's a, a specific car that's in a scene that's, um, that's really good. That should be split off. But <laughs> don't, don't just split stuff off because it's not dialogue. Um, a lot of that stuff needs to stay in the dialogue track, so it's processed with, the, um, with, the, with the, um, all the processing that the dialogue mixer is using. Yeah, Scott and I have come up against that a couple of times where I need to talk to the editor afterwards and say, you know, you're working too hard. <laughs> Quite honestly, you're working way too hard. Um, you're taking out every sound that's between, and it starts making everything sound extremely cutting. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're ever unsure whether to pull out something, speak to your supervisor or your editor, I mean, or your mixer, um, or put it, you know, on a track below, muted. But the golden rule is let the track live, you know, and a lot of that movement is part of what makes it live. I always like the expression, do no harm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, next question we have is um, uh, also uh, about ed uh, processing and editorial is, um, do you prefer rendered in or do you want an automation with a plugin? Okay, that's, that was a big, that's a big thing. I saw that, um, mm -hmm. always render. Always, always render never always. give us never, never make us have to take your plugin in we may not have your plugin no. um, or the processing up, right or the processing. <laughs> I, I mean we've come up against especially a lot of times what you'll find is 
when you're doing TV shows, you'll end up getting a pilot that somebody else did in another stage or another, you know, another team did. And so they send you the session. And what Scott and I have done, because we've looked at these sessions and we're like, I don't have that, I don't have that, I don't have that. And that <laughs> session is massive. And why mm -hmm. does it have to be? And we just take it all in. And unless they're giving us just the stems to work with, if they're giving us the whole session, we just bring in the session materials. We work with the stems and then where there's new material, we'll open up, you know, um, just the regions. We'll import, import all the regions and all the material. But, you know, if you send us anything that has to be rendered on stage, it's not, it's not going to happen. You might as well just send us the blank track or send us, send us the rendered and then the unrendered if it's something you're unsure of. I have, a, um, I have an exception to that, and only because um, we, I ended up working on an animated show where there were specific um, oh. characters that were uh, robots or whatever. Yeah. And we, had, um, we had figured out the treatments, and um, we had figured out the exact plugins that were to be used, and the editor knew how to use those, and he would automate those things so that when it came to the stage, they were automated on plugins, but the mixer had the ability to go back. Yeah, and, they, and the conversation it. had already taken place. That's right. That's, but but in, in general, yes, it's true. You probably should render most things as opposed to um, relying on automation. Yeah. And uh, just uh, going into PFX and extra tracks and splitting things off, um, what about optional tracks for use in later international versions? Uh, Marla, do you ever ask for that from your editors? Do, do uh, Scott and uh, Sherry, do you guys ever see those kind of international options? included maybe on extracts or muted? Well, for me, real quick, the main thing would be like in effects if there's English in the Walla. So maybe it's like the exact right track and it's really great and it's gonna be perfect for the domestic and you can't actually find a track that has that same kind of character with, that doesn't have any English. So you can do one of two things. You can cut out any English that you hear or you can like talk to Scott, let, make sure he knows or put it on a separate track and say, this has English in it the supervisor wants it for the domestic here's you know a knockoff for them and he not quite as good but it doesn't have any english um and the thing with dialogue that is sometimes tricky is if somebody's singing and let's say playing the guitar in production and that's all married i mean normally you want to have music and dialogue separate so you know, I usually kick that up to the producer and say, okay, can you check with international because this stuff's married. Maybe you want to put, you know, that person singing in an optional track or, you know, like, let's say it's somebody making a speech like Barack Obama or something that like, you're probably not going to revoice Barack Obama. You know what I mean? So like that needs to be kind of married or optional or whatever. Like that might even go in the foreign with the English just because that's who it is. That, from my perspective, is I communicate with the producer, and then I tell the mixers that it's coming. After that, I'm not sure what they do. <laughs> no, I, I end up doing a lot of the um, the M and E, so I'm thinking on the stage um, what things need to be separated. And um, typically, um, as well as my hard effects backgrounds and foley tracks, I have an alt effects stem, a five one alt effects, or typically it's Walla, and I'll put all the Walla there or things that I know that has specific English so that it's not uh, baked into my background stem. So we have the ability to, um, to pull some of those out. Um, I think it's um, with the dialogue tracks, if it's possible to split foreign language out, that's, um, that is a good thing because those, they typically want that an option track, uh, but it's not always possible. And of course, when you're delivering um, your material to whoever's doing the M&E, Typically, they'll give them the source session too, so mm -hmm. they uh, still have the ability. I know if I'm doing an M and E and I have a foreign line that's overlapping an English line, and I have to split it out. I just have to go into Sherry's session and mute a couple tracks and string off a new new piece of it. So, um, obviously, we when we're mixing the domestic, that's our primary focus, and we shouldn't um, compromise the integrity of the domestic mix for the foreign mix. Uh, but if there is areas where we can isolate a few things like I do with my alt effects stem, um, it can be helpful down the line. I always like to have uh, at least uh, in, in effects, um, if there's an effects uh, that they're using, like maybe a uh, something that's licensable that has a little bit of English in it, that's like maybe the, you know, the TV 
kind of thing, the TV in the background or something like that, that they, uh, or a sports game or something, that they make it a really bright color so that I know when I have to go in for the M&E, oh, okay, that guy's going to need to be, and that guy's going to need to be. And, you know, I, can e I can easily be like, all right, well, that, you know, that fuchsia guy, that's got to go in another, yeah. But I also, like, I also like what Marla was saying is um, go through those background tracks and listen to them and get rid of that dialogue before we have to deal with it. Because a lot of times it ends up in there and you, you don't hear it with all the dialogue in, but you're mixing the M&E and all of a sudden you hear this English walla in the, in the bar scene that you never heard before and you have to go in and edit it out. So, or the mixer is um, trying to lower it for like 20 minutes and looking for every show hide they can find and only to realize, <laughs> oh damn, it's in the effects track. It's like, why did I take him offline to start with? My next group of questions is actually um, based on communication, um, which I, I really love that we've gone into so much detail, but what I love is that there seems to be a natural theme through everybody's responses about how, well, oh, I communicated that specific case with this editor, or I communicated this with my mixers. It, communication really does seem to be key. So one question that came up a couple of times, and I love it, what is the most common question that editors don't ask you as mixers, but they really should? Your layout, and if they, and the discussion of processing, mm -hmm. not assuming. I think that's that's one of the biggest is um, uh, ask what the what your preferences are for the edit, and um, have a discussion with the mixer about processing. And also, one thing that I know is something that would be discussed later, but. Um, I, and I know all of us feel this way, any time an editor has asked to come down to the dub stage, once they've been editing and they have a free day, I love it. And I know that they see things that they never thought was happening. They, it, it's just like production mixers. You bring them down to the dub stage and the world opens up to them. And nine out of 10 times, it changes the way they edit because you can show them right there where you're having an issue or what worked mm -hmm. so great, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it's, it's really wonderful having an editor come down to the stage and sit next to you mm -hmm. and see the, the issues that you're dealing with and how things work. So I think there's three things, you know, the, the communication of processing, the communication regarding layout, and once you can, ask to come down to the dub stage and many new editors are a little timid about asking that but most mixers do not mind a bit not at all yeah you know, and I, go ahead scott oh just in, in addition to the track layout and stuff um you know communicate whether they prefer clip gain or volume graphing you know that that's part of the communication as well i was just going to say yeah and speaking to sherry's point if you are just in your little room editing all the time you're going to just keep doing things the same way over and over again. If you reach out to the mixers and say, after every mix even, or just say, listen, I'm available after every mix if you have time and if you have feedback and you don't want to like take up their time, but just let them know that you want feedback, you want to come listen. Um, and like for effects editing, I remember when I was cutting effects, I wasted so much time cutting things I didn't need to. Like for example, in a car chase, I would cut every engine, every tire for like those, you know, two cars that are behind the main car and I'm cutting them and, you know, I'm organizing it all. And then you go to the dub stage and all you hear is blaring music, you know, the acceleration, <laughs> the cut to the, the pedal, you know, the tire squeals. And, and then you also figure out how to lay it out too for, for, for Scott, meaning like you can lay it out so that when you, cut to an insert or whatever that is on a, a set of tracks so those things will pop and then have everything else be on other tracks and again you just realize what you don't have to cut like i really didn't need to cut every car's engine for the entire duration of my car chase well in in point of what you're saying and scott and i just went through this on something that we did also and we just we talked about it um and something that i tell a lot of new effects editors and directors even is you're telling a story, even with the sound, you know, with the sound effects and the dialogue. But when you're in a crazy scene that's very chaotic and very cacophonous, there are point effects that help share that scene and tell that scene, the comedy of it or the horror of it or whatever it is that you're trying to portray in that scene. 
they're a point effect. And mm -hmm. all the other effects around it are there and need to be cut possibly, but there are point effects that tell the story and follow the story and follow the picture with those point effects. And you'll be able to get through that cacophony what's needed to get across. I think uh, to, to second that and to um, support Marla's point is that um, hear a dog, see a dog. If, um, <laughs> if I'm mixing a scene and I'm doing a car chase, I want to hear the car that's on camera. If I'm doing a, a gun battle, I don't care about the 20 guys that are shooting behind. I want to hear the guy that's on camera. And so editorial wise, if you can help to weed that out, because, um, you know, 50 percent of making a, a good action scene work, I end up weeding out a bunch of stuff. I might mute all the backgrounds because it's not going to play. I find the specific uh, effects that are that are working and I have to weed out and get rid of the extraneous stuff. Foley is another big one. I don't care about the the three tracks of background footsteps. I, I, I mute those immediately. I want to have the ones that are on camera. And even if I have five people walking together, I'll probably pick the two people that are walking the front and mute the rest of them. You want to uh, pick the things that are on camera in front of you and, um, and feature them and don't waste your time with all the extraneous stuff because it's not going to play. So one of the questions that people uh, that editors wanted to know is when should you begin communicating with your re-recording mixer? Um, and I guess Marla, maybe you should speak on this too. Should your editors reach out directly to their re-recording mixer? Should they reach out to you? Like what is the process? How should they get um, in touch and when? Well, I would say as soon as you know you're on the project together. Um, and sometimes maybe like the three of us will have a meeting or like the four of us will have a meeting. Um, or if it's like, you know, you've been mixing with these mixers forever. Like I may not have, I may not need my dialogue editor to meet with Steve, for example, Steve Fitzmaurice. Maybe I'll just communicate to the dialogue mixer. But somebody has to communicate with somebody. So, um, and I'm usually the point person. Um, because I'm the liaison between the clients and the mixers and the picture editor, uh, sound editors. So I would say uh, communicate as soon as you know that who's on it and when it's starting and, you know, get that relationship going, if, especially if it's somebody you don't know. Um, and if it's going to be too in the weeds about specific questions that the dialogue editor has for the mixer and now I'm just kind of in the way, I'll say, okay, you two talk about that because that's like, now we're getting in the weeds. Excellent. And I actually have a couple of questions specifically for you as a supervising sound editor. Um, how much do you expect your sound editors to cut in a, in a given day? Like what is a typical workload that, that, that you feel is fair for uh, an effects editor or a dialogue editor? Generally, it's about eight to 10 minutes of screen time an hour. Or so, I mean, sorry, a day. Wow. So it's like one minute an hour. Damn. No, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's going to depend on how complex the scenes are. So there's going to be some scenes that might be a lot easier. Like, let's say there's like a montage in the middle of it. <laughs> it's like all music. Well, you're going to blow through that pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, generally about an hour per screen minute um, is a good place to start. Okay. And, and um, what are some specific characteristics that attract you to a particular sound editor? Like, why would you hire... An individual, like what are the things that make you go, ooh, that one, I, that one's the one for the project. That's my, that's my guy. Well, I will tell you, all things being equal, like let's say you've got two or three people that have similar resume, similar skill set. Um, of those three, personality is going to get them over the finish line. Meaning, if there's somebody who doesn't complain, they've got a great attitude, they're up for anything, they don't get defensive, if you need to tell them something really important about the nature of what they're doing and how to make it better, like, I'm gonna take them all day, every day. In fact, I might take somebody who doesn't have as much experience as an editor who's got an attitude and then just kind of mentor them and get them be there creatively and technically um, because personality and diplomacy and there's a bunch of politics. The politics don't come into play too much with the editors. That's more things that happen with the backfield and on the dev stage and that type of stuff. But, but to answer your question, um, it's just a really good attitude because I'm assuming if you're coming to me, you've got the skill sets or if I, if you referred to me by somebody 
you know, like any of you, like, all right, I know that they can actually cut, um, but are they going to be a pleasure to work with and are they really going to, you know, complement the team? Because these, these scenarios can get really stressful really quickly. You know, we can have a situation where the picture department is just doing what they're doing and they don't care that they just cut down your time and now you're short turnaround. And, you know, there can be some really extenuating circumstances that make everything truly tricky, you know? And if I, and if I know that somebody will roll with it and not get upset and not get angry and not stomp around and just be like, okay, what do you need me to do? You know, um, that's, that's going to be my good fit. That's going to need to be good. cool as a cucumber. That's right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and uh, two more sound, uh, sound supervision questions, although I think that it'd be great if uh, Scott and, and uh, Sherry, if you could jump in too. Um, one is, um, how, do, how does sound supervision contribute creatively to the final mix on the dub stage? Like, what is the creative contribution of the sound supervisor? Well, I would say, first, the fact that the sound supervisor has been with the project the longest of anybody in this particular world. So, you know, I may have been working with the picture department early on, they're asking for things here and there, they're sending me little clips, then I go to the spotting session and they convey what it is that they want. So, you know, the producer, the post producer is not gonna come in till later, like the second day or even the third day, depending on the dynamics and how busy they are and all of that. So I'm the one who kind of knows, generally speaking, what it is that they're after. So my, one of my contributions is that I can communicate that to the mixers. Like, oh, you know what, I really know that they are attached to the temp here, so don't even bother, you know, adding stuff or, or let's go with the spirit of it. Um, so, so that's one thing. The other thing is that while I'm sitting there, even if, you know, uh, Scott's offline, let's say, or he's under the headphones and it's just Sherry and she's going along and she's doing her thing, um, I'm already thinking of fixes and I'm, I'm paying attention to everything and circling back with stuff. Now I'm not going to pester her every five minutes with a fix. Here's a fix. Here's a fix. Like I'm going to kind of like make a list as she's going because that first day, as you well know, Carol, um, you guys are just finding your footing. You're getting acquainted mm -hmm. with the characters if you don't know the show and what you yeah, have. Yeah, you're just weeding. You're just, so, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> you have to train the clients if, if for any reason they're there on day one is don't jump in. We'll get to it. Just let them, you know, go through the material. And mm -hmm. so, so I'm like following along and go, oh, you know what? I think I can find a better alt for that or I think mm -hmm. there might be a better mic, but I'm not going to, bother sharing with that information. Like, let's say I'm still shooting the ADR. Um, I may find that better mic or that alt and I'll include that in my fix session A, let's say. And then, you know what I mean? Like she thinks that she's just getting a session with <laughs> ADR, but I'm sneaking in something, but I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to, they've got a lot going on in the mixer. So I don't want to take up any bandwidth <laughs> you know, of, of their attention, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'll just, without having to speak everything all the time, I'll just, you know, include it. And then they'll get to it and they'll go, oh, she's got it off. And then they'll, you know what I mean? So, so mm -hmm. that cuts down on the time. Because every time you speak on the dub stage, you're taking up time and energy and everybody has to focus on you and see what it is you have I to I feel say. like you've done this for me before and I've been like, oh, that's great. Because in my mind, some I, I, I'll mix it. I have a little bit of a you know, always have the clock in the back of my head going, okay, you know, we need to get to about here by here. And I have mental goals I need to achieve. And I've, there have been times I, I feel like I've, I've mixed and there's been a section where uh, I've been like, all right, well, it's not the greatest, but it's way better. I'm just going to hold on it. We're going to come back to it. I'll put a marker in. And then lo and behold, you've been like, I found this really cool alt. And I've been like, ah, oh. yeah. So, <laughs> it's really wonderful. Because I, <laughs> yeah, I got other things going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I want to I wanna, I wanna, um, I wanna second what you're saying, Marla, about um, waiting for the mixers to get through their first pass. Because a lot of times when we're trying to sort through stuff, it's good for us to do that. Um, there are super, I've been, had occasions where supervisors have been too heavy handed on the stage and it's, um, their input needs to be at the appropriate time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, it's valuable, but yeah. It's, I, exactly. Yeah, that's and the right other time. thing I really appreciate is um, I've had supervisors that have gone through 
because um, they they haven't always heard everything the effects editor or the dialogue editor and they're going through in headphones while you're working and they, they've they're coming up with ads and stuff before you even get to them and, and getting that nice little ad session that has all the stuff that um, you know that's a nice subtle way of doing that also um, once you get to the point of having the producers come and play back the show the supervisor um, if they can slip back into more of a supportive role where they're reacting to notes as opposed to imposing their them. note they're, they're <laughs> what they want the mix to be that's very helpful to the process as well it helps all of us be more of a team um, creating the um, the type of sound that the producers want and and I would just times, say a lot of a lot of times let me just say this a lot of times when you're working on a show on a series that's continuous and you're working with the same supervisor day in and day out and week in and week out the wonderful thing is you can develop that silent language of you're struggling with something and they may be on headphones so they're not aware of it and you turn around and you just look at them and they take off their heads, headphones and they just nod back at you because they realize, okay, got it. And you just move on. You don't even have to say anything. And especially when clients are around, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, you just have a silent language where you know and it comes in your fixed session. A good supervisor will be aware of what you're doing and be aware to even, you know, lock eyes with you every once in a while. Or, I mean, I've gone, I've even gotten to the point when I've had a forum of people where I'll text my supervisor during the playback and go, hey, can you find a better one for that line, you know, and, and they get it and they, they've got it by the time we get to the end of playback. Um, we can do that these days, easily. Yeah. I was just going to say, I was just going to say about texting, um, the dub stage can be a landmine. <laughs> oh, let's just say that. Um, I mean, everybody's very friendly and it's all, it's all good, but you know, everybody's human at the end of the day and they have their own needs mm. and they're very susceptible to things. So like, for example, well, the clock is running, the clock is running clock and is running, but you're like, on. Like, yeah. Let's say you miss a line of dialogue, meaning somebody comes in, maybe it's a showrunner, I hope we're not at that point, but they're like, you know, we're missing a line of dialogue and everybody turns to me and, you know, I'll, I'll find it or I'll help or whatever. But at that point now you've lost their confidence because now they're like, well, if they, they, she missed this line, then what else did, did she miss? And now I've got to ha have my eye on her. Even if it was just an honest mistake, it would never happen again. So not, that I'm advocating subterfuge per se. <laughs> but sometimes, for example, what I will do on the dev stage, and I don't know if any other supervisor does this because as Sherry knows, we've been through this. Um, you know, uh, if, if a line of dialogue is missing or if a line of dialogue is added, like let's say they broom something intentionally and the dialogue editor is working and they handle out or whatever and it makes sense with the story in that moment, um, and they leave it in, but it's not what's in the guide track, that can be as big a, of a mistake as mi uh, missing something. So what I'll do is because there can be a missing line at any point, missing word of the process, like maybe didn't get in the assembly, because maybe that line of dialogue is in the effects AAF, and so it didn't get in the dialogue assembly bill. Well, they're mm -hmm. still gonna, that's still your fault. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that, that's how they'll view it, is that I missed mm -hmm. the line of dialogue, even though it wasn't on their EDL, it's okay. Again, not about finger pointing. It's about solutions. So a line of dialogue could be missed at that point. It could be missed by the dialogue editor because the paper's over it with Phil or something. Two weeks, two weeks uh, later. <laughs> somebody's in Japan. Um, or it can be just accidentally on the mix stage. It gets either muted in the session or the faders down. And, and the, the ones that usually get missed are the ones that it plays without them. Um, mm -hmm. Like, it, like, you know, if somebody's got their lips flapping, everybody's going to notice early in the process that we're missing line. Um, so what I'll do is during one of, well, actually most of my playbacks, I will, with my Pro Tools, I'm not actually running in sync with the dub stage, just because I'm not really tied into the time code, although you could be. But I have a way of pretty quickly getting in sync with the stage picture to the point where it's kind of phasing. Like I'm hearing the mix at my right ear, and I'm hearing the guide track on, I, uh, on my left ear. And as we're playing back, yeah, I'm doing my notes and I'm writing things down like mixed notes that I have, which by the way, I'm not always gonna chime in because I'm mindful of the clock and I'm mindful of everybody else getting their notes mm -hmm. done, unless it's something like a missing line. So in that case, 
or unless there's time, maybe everybody finishes their notes and they're like, Marley, do you have anything? Like, yeah, I would really love that. Blah, blah, blah. But so in that way, even if the dialogue editor had all the pieces and God forbid Sherry just had a fader down, but if I was just checking the dialogue guide against the dialogue cut, that's not going to solve the problem of if on the mix stage, the fader's down or something. So if I'm listening to the actual mix and I see a word is missing or a word is added, I will text Sherry or Carol and I will say, missing line of dialogue. It's on AF2 at this time code. And then they will usually very with a with you know very, very oh, calmly nice. be like maybe even when the, the backfield might be talking to themselves, they might either slip it in or the producer's gonna have that note. And they will say something like, oh you know what I have that note as well. Yeah, let me let me just raise that or let me find that. They, they just minimize the fact that it's this huge, horrible fuck up that is now going to make the trust factor, you know, unravel possibly. So it's not about, like I said, I mean, you always want to be upfront and honest and all of that good stuff, mm -hmm. but you've got to be mindful of the politics and the diplomacy and mm -hmm. protect your team. And yeah, and let somebody yeah. run with something in a way that now you've just unraveled all the goodwill that you've built up. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Oh, I love that's such great advice. Um, so uh, I have just a, a, a question or two before we conclude for today. And they're nice uh, general questions. I think they're perfect um, for to, to end our, our, our discussion today. Um, the question is, when editors attend the mixes, how do you arrange that? How should you bring it up? And what is good etiquette while sitting in on the mix? <laughs> Um, well, I would say how you arrange it is, especially if if it's not one of the clients there, then it's then I just say to Sherry and Scott, hey, the dialogue editor, the effects editor wants to come sit in. It's day one. You mind if they just kind of sit in with you? And then they'll, you know, 99% of the time say, yeah, great, bring them. And then they'll sit there quiet as a mouse um, and let the mixers do their work. Um, if for some reason you want it a little later in the process. And sometimes it may just be because I want them to develop a relationship with the client as well. Um, you know what I mean? Like, like my, personally, if there's a mistake on the stage, I'll usually own it. Like I'll usually say, oh yeah, I should have blah, blah, blah. Because I have a relationship with the client, generally speaking. But if I throw my dialogue editor in the bus, it's human nature, they might say, well, I don't want to ever use that dialogue editor again, but mm -hmm. they'll forgive me because we have this relationship. So like, but then conversely, if the dialogue editor or the effects editor does something great, I will give them the credit for the same reason because my relationship is already solid, but I want them to get the credit. I want them to get the name recognition. So sometimes I will want them to come on the dub stage to just put a face to the name, like, hey, everybody, Scott Howler's here. You know, he cut the dialogue. And then, but then it's also incumbent upon Scott at that point not to suck up all the energy in the room, but to just kind of blend in, be very nice and cordial. But the backfield, generally speaking, have big personalities. That's why they do what they do. Do you know what I mean? So you really need to take the temperature of the room and, you know, not, um, just take up all the space with your own little anecdote or what, you know what I mean? Just like, the, the, other, the other important thing is when you have a guest on a stage, you have to talk to your AP because a lot of times it involves um, permission mm -hmm. and finding a non-disclosed or a ND so that everyone's cool. So I think when we've had people come in on a show that's maybe a little more high profile, you have to make sure and, um, and go through the proper channels to make sure that it's okay that someone else is on right, the stage. But if it's the editor on the show, it's, it's, you know, it's different because they've already seen the show. Yeah. But, but for anybody else, absolutely. But as far as that, I mean, I'll, I'll let them come and sit right next to me. I don't like them even sitting in the backfield behind me. I want them right next to me because that's where they'll get the benefit. And I ask them to, you know, please don't query me about anything during the session and lunch break or afterwards. I'll, you know, I'll answer as many questions as I can. And if I have a point to make to them, I'll turn to them while I'm working on their session and they're cut and say, see, if you had done, did you see what I just did? And that was because if you had done this, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have to do that. And they go, ah, oh, yeah, I got it. So hopefully those are the kinds of things that they get to see when they're there. And that becomes helpful to the editor in the long run. 
I, I would second that, Sherry. I actually had a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful dialogue editor who, God bless her, came and sat it on me. And she um, had struggled with the scene that was next to a highway during kind of a windstorm with a crazy generator. And it was just a wall of... And we had spent a lot of time on it, and she did a wonderful job, and I thought I did a really good job. And basically, she, she remembered the original, and she was there during playback day and wanted to say, oh, my God, you did it's such, it's such a good job how it all came together. Um, but by mentioning that, what she did uh, to, to give a compliment, like in good effort, is all of a sudden the EP's direction focused was now on the noise of that scene, and it made that scene another hour and a half of, <laughs> of playing with it. And, and, and later I had to pull her aside and be like, I love you, I adore you, I appreciate it, send me an email, wait till after, pull me aside. I don't mind. I want you to ask questions. That's why you're there. I want that communication. But how things are presented to the client, as Marla was saying, it's not about it's about being cohesive and being strong in your appearance in your service for the client. Not about being deceptive. But it, it can very easily change the temperature of the room. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big deal. Big deal. Big deal. And the people who navigate that the best are incredibly successful in this industry. Incredibly successful. In fact, I would say uh, Scott and, and Cherry, you guys do that super, super well. And I've definitely seen Marla definitely take a room's anxiety and just, that is, the, those are excellent professionals. That is a professional skill in, in this industry. Thank yeah. You, but I want to say one thing, and Marla is the one person who can relate to this. I think what everybody needs to learn pretty early on is that we're not doing brain surgery. And the way that you come into a room and interact with the clients is what will bring the room feel up or down. And I have to say from in my early days at certain points, it's like I did think it was brain surgery and it was like I had to learn to chill. And luckily at a certain point, I just went, wait a second, I want to have fun doing this and this is going to be, you know, and everything changed for me at that point because it was at a point in my career where it just needed to happen. I needed to, to own the fact that I was kind of being a bitch for a while. <laughs> and I didn't want to be. Um, and luckily that was many years ago, but Marla can remember because she knew me during some of that, some of those phases. But there were also a lot of extenuating circumstances presented around that time period in our industry and what I was doing. Guys, thank you so very much. I honestly, I wish I had had this, uh, this conversation and this openness about knowledge in my career or earlier. I think this is just wonderful. Um, this is all the time we have for today, uh, but I want to thank all of our guests and our viewers. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to specifically thank uh, April Tucker and Carrie Keyes for organizing and bringing us all together today. And finally, I just want to say thank you to Sound Girls. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for representing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, have a great uh, day and uh, happy sound editing. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Great fun. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. <laughs>